Good evening, folks. Thank you, David, for the scripture reading and Eddie for the prayer and for the good singing. We appreciate it very much. And I just want you to know it's an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to stand before you tonight. Um, the, the one we're going to look at tonight is what does the Bible say about faith? And if we have time, we'll look at one other, maybe hit, hit just the high spots of it. What does the Bible say about faith? First of all, what is the definition of faith? Okay, let me give it to you in layman terms. In other words, ordinary terms. The definition of faith is this, taking God at his word. Let me repeat that. Faith is taking God at his word. Now we're going to look at a scripture in just a minute that reminds us that that when we take God at his word, then we believe in things that we can't see at the moment. We'll see them later on in eternity, but we can't see them right now. But we believe in them anyway because God's word tells us that these things exist. So faith is taking God at his word. And speaking of God's word, let me share this very familiar scripture with you, which the, our first two songs tonight basically uh, explain the scripture I'm about to read to you. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're looking at verses 16 and 17, and I'm using the NIV, but any translation, English translation you use, teaches the same basic thing. All scripture is God breathed. Uh, now, some translations say all scripture is inspired of God, which means that because the word inspired means God breathed. It means that God breathed life into the word and it became a living word. Remember when God made man from the dust of the earth and then breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. Well, when God breathes words or breathes life into word, then that word becomes God's word. And so again, the scripture says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God, that means uh, the Christian people, so that the person, a man or woman of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the scripture is teaching us here that, uh, that, that, uh, that we are equipped for every good work. Uh, there's another scripture in, in um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, that says our, that, that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, how has he done that? He's done that through his word. Okay, you can't talk about faith until you, uh, you pay honor to at least two scriptures. The first one is this, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. This is a standalone scripture here, even though... Um, you, can, you can put it in context or you can take it out of context and just use it by itself. Either way, it means the same thing. And here's what the scripture says. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Or, um, and by the way, the word walk, when you read it in, as far as Christianity is concerned, means uh, we live. It's according to the way, that's the way we live. And so we live by faith not, and not by sight which means that we believe and we trust in some things that we can't even see with the human fleshly eye. But we know that they're true. We know that they exist. We know that they can be counted on because God's word says that they exist, they can be counted on, and that they are true. That's what it means to live by faith. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. And this, of course, is the primer, you might say, on, uh, on faith. Now, what I want to do, first of all, is to highlight verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let me repeat that statement. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must to believe that he exists. Let me repeat that because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God 
rewards those who earnestly seek him. So you say, how, I wonder, could I be rewarded of God? Well, the scripture says, earnestly seek him. Be hungry for him. Be, be hungry for, for uh, you know, uh, hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, seek and you will find is what the scripture is teaching. Now, let's go to the first of the chapter and let the scripture define faith. Now, faith, verse 1, chapter 11, Hebrews. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible or what can be seen. Then he starts telling us about people who live by faith. Verse four, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was committed as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. In other words, this man's example, Abel's example, where he offered to God according to God's word or God's instructions and it pleased God. And that example still speaks today even though he's been dead thousands of years. Verse 5, by faith Enoch, and that's an Old Testament character you find um, early on in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. And here's a man who, he's an exception, but he didn't die. One day God just took him. And we often say, just as a preacher's uh, um, story, so to speak, that one day Enoch was out walking with God. And they walked and walked and talked and talked and walked and talked all day long. And when the day was finished, God said to Enoch, Enoch, we've walked a long way today. As a matter of fact, we've walked so far that it's closer to my home than it is to yours. So why don't you just come on and go with me? Well, that's a preacher way of saying that Enoch didn't die. He just, uh, he's, uh, he, he's an exception. He, um, he walked with God. And God took him. So this is what the verse says, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Now, how do you please God? Remember, verse 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. And so apparently, Enoch was taken away to be with God because he pleased God because he was walking by faith. For before he was taken, he was committed as one who pleased God, verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And now he talks about Noah. Noah who built an ark, a big old boat, even though at that point it had never rained. As a matter of fact, all during the time he was building that boat, and most of us believe that it took him 120 years to build that ark, and people no doubt made fun of him and laughed at him because he was building a boat to float in water, and they had never seen water. There had never been a flood. There had never been rain that that's stacked up on the earth like that. And now you could believe it because, uh, you, because of where we live. You know, you've seen the water stack up. But... Um, uh, so, so why in the world would a man build a huge boat when it didn't even rain? Well, the reason he did it was because he was a man who lived by faith and he took God at his word because God said, Noah, here's what you need to do. You need to build a boat, a big boat, and you need to build it exactly according to these dimensions. And Noah did exactly what God, he took God at his word. Verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things yet or not yet seen, in other words, it hadn't rained yet, in holy fear, that means respect for God, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that comes, of the righteousness that comes by faith. And now he gets into Abraham. Now here's Abraham who is, uh, everything's going along fine for him. 
He's, uh, he's just minding his own business. He's living in the land of his fathers. And as far as he knows, he's going to live there a long time, have a good life and die a ripe old age and never leave his home country. That's the way it looks. But he's also a man who believes in God and lives by faith. And so verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going. And by the way, it's very important for you and I to trust God, even though we don't know where that trust is taking us. But we can be assured that God is not going to lead us to some place that's going to result in our harm. He's going to only bless us and take us to the place that is, that is in our best interest and according to God's will. Well, Abraham didn't know where he was going when he left his homeland. And he went on up to Haran and then on, on down to Canaan and wound up even going south of there and toward Egypt and all that. Uh, but, but he was walking and living by faith. Verse 9, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. God. Well, Abraham did live to be a ripe old age. As a matter of fact, when he was about 100, verse 11, by faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise, verse 12. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants from this one man as good as dead, as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sands on the seashore. Verse 13, listen to this statement. All these people were still living by faith when they died. There's a song in our songbook called Living by Faith in Jesus Above. Trusting, confiding, or trusting, is it, and, and abiding in his great love. Well, the scripture has given us, and, and, and goes on to give us many more examples of people who live by faith. Now, why would, the, why would God use the Hebrew writer to use what we call an entire chapter, talking about people who lived hundreds and even thousands of years ago, and pointing out their example to us? Why would he do that? Because he wants us to see how faith works in real life, how it works in our lives. He wants us to see the practical aspect of faith. It's, yes, it's believing in the invisible, uh, but it's also taking God at his word and doing what God wants us to do and obeying God because God simply tells us that this is what we need to do to please him. And we do it trusting, knowing that it's according to God's will and that God will bless us if we earnestly seek him. Okay, that's a little bit of a primer on faith. And of course, Faith is one of these things that Eric and I and any other gospel preacher can talk about for decades and never exhaust the subject or the examples that the scripture gives us. And so it's very important, I think, for us to understand that. Okay, let's move on to this business of works and treasure in heaven. Now, we're going to have a, a preacher, deacon, um, elder meeting in a little while, and so I won't, I won't dwell on this a long time. And I'll take up on that final subject. Uh, which is division, or you might call it unity, which is the other side of division, next week. Okay, works and treasure in heaven. Now, these two things are, uh, are, are, they are intertwined. They are linked together. They're like links in a chain. Now, first of all, let me explain to you what I'm not talking about when I'm talking about works. I'm not talking about working our way to heaven. I'm not talking about working in such a way that God feels obligated to give us eternal life because, hey, we've just knocked ourselves out. We've just worked, 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 and therefore we have earned our own salvation because the scripture teaches that no one can earn their salvation. It is a, well, okay, let's just go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're looking at verses 8 through 10 and uh, there's no passage in the Bible probably that is more succinct 
and concise in describing this than these three verses. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through, listen to this, underline these two words, through faith. How do you get grace? Through faith. Now let me repeat it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And faith is taking God at his word and doing what he tells us to do. Trusting that he is telling us what we need. Okay, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is a gift through faith. You access the gift through faith. It is the gift of God, not by works. Now that works there means meritorious works. And what I mean by meritorious works is that if we think that we can obligate God by saying, okay, God, you see what I've done? I've done this good deed in your name and I've done this good deed in your name and I've helped this person and I've stood up for you at this moment and I've, I've done a lot to serve you and therefore I demand that you save me because you can't deny me salvation because I worked so hard to earn it. And he's saying salvation by grace through faith is not earned through meritorious works, okay? Not by works, so that no one can boast. That's, that's, those are important words, so that no person can boast. So what does he mean? Well, he means so that we can't strut around and say, yeah, I'm going to heaven because <clears throat> I deserve it. I've earned it. I worked my way and I'll go there because God can't turn me down. I'm going to heaven because I'm such a hard worker. No, he says no one can boast. All we can do is just humble ourselves before God and say, thank God that he loved me so much that he sent his son to suffer and pay the penalty that I deserve. And so we're very humble as we realize we're saved and we're very thankful that we're saved and we realize that there's nothing we could do to save ourselves except embrace the grace of God by faith. And as we embrace the grace of God through faith, then of course we are, uh, we're very thankful and we're humble. So we don't boast that we've saved ourselves. It's Jesus who saves. Now, verse 10, he gives us some, he gives us some balancing here. He talks about how that people who have been saved by grace through faith ought to be people who are so grateful and will be people who are so grateful that they want to serve God. And serving God means doing good things for other people and passing along the, the grace that we've received. So he says this in verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Okay, do, do we do good works to be saved? No, he's already taught us that our works will not earn us salvation. Then why do we do good works? Because not to be saved, but because we are saved. Saved people behave in a particular kind of way. And that's why we're faithful to come to worship. That's why we have our visitation program. That's why we are generous in our giving. That's why we're in our day by day lives. We are looking for ways in which we can be a, a bright light and we can be salt and to the, and the salt of the earth, so to speak, in people's lives because we've been saved for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God had in mind all along that he would rescue and cleanse a group of people. <coughs> These people, of course, are, are, uh, are his family, which is the church, the body of Christ. And God always intended that there would be a group of people on earth, no matter how sinful and no matter how terrible and no matter how dangerous this world becomes, such as in Haiti Saturday night uh, a week ago, that there would all be, always be a group of people that made their community a better place. They would be people who were always willing to lend a helping hand. They would be people that uh, you are always safe around. There would be people who would provide light and salt and goodwill and peace and brotherly love in their community. Why? Because they were created to do so. And they were created to do so when they were washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Sins were forgiven. They were added to the Lord's family of the church. And now they're ready to go about doing good. 
<clears throat> Why? Because, well, when Jesus was on earth, Acts 10, 38, that's what he did. He went about doing good. Now let's go to Titus. Titus chapter 2. And this will bleed over into chapter 3. <clears throat> Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. This means that Jesus appeared on earth and his gospel is intended for everyone on earth. Jew and Gentile, covering every, uh, all, all phases of mankind. Verse 12, it teaches, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now notice the difference. He's not saying that he created a group of people who would save themselves by doing good works. He, he said he would create a group of people who were eager to do what is good. In other words, to do good things. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Verse, chapter three, verse one. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to be ready to do whatever is good. To slander no one, he goes on to say in verse two, to be peaceable and considerate and to show true humility toward all men. Skipping on over to verse 14, he says this, our people, talking about the church, our people must learn to, to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. And so, yes, I'll say it again, Christians really are a bunch of do-gooders. We are, that's, that's exactly what our purpose is in life, is to do all the good we can, and of course, no harm at all. With that in mind, let's talk about this business of, uh, of doing good and laying up treasure in heaven. And now we're going to Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six. And this, of course, is where the Lord is talking about how that you can send treasure on to heaven. Now, it's not like uh, uh, contributing to an IRA or contributing to a, an investment plan or something like that, except in a sense it is, but it is a spiritual, eternal investment plan. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And by the way, let me just stop here. And the Bible always balances things out. It talks about counting the cost and it talks about being prepared and things like this. So the scripture is not teaching us that we shouldn't try to save some money for a rainy day and that we shouldn't have some sort of well thought out investment plan and, and, and think about the future and all that. What the Bible is teaching us that is that we should not put all of our hope on, on things that are material because material things are, um, they're, well, they're, they're, they're temporary and they won't last. What we should do is think about things that will, will last and make that the most important things in our life. So he says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But rather, verse 20, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart also, or there your heart will be also, I should say. So what he's saying is, is that you can send treasure onto heaven. Now, when we are generous with God, uh, as the contribution baskets are passed uh, on Sunday morning and Sunday evening in the other room, then that's one way in which we can send treasure on to heaven, but there are many other ways. And one of the many ways that we can do is that when we bless someone else's life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we are someone who adds value to someone, when we 
do something that uh, relieves a burden or relieves a, a, a problem or a pain or if we share a, a burden with someone else, if we, if we are concerned about more than just ourselves, then we're sending treasures on to heaven. Treasure in heaven are the things that will last throughout eternity. They are much more valuable than physical things that will perish. We lay up treasures in heaven when we put the Lord first in our lives. And we must, uh, we must put our trust in the things that will last and not just in physical things. You know, the Lord tells a story about, uh, this is Luke chapter 12, about a man who is really making a lot of money. As a matter of fact, he's, 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 he's a farmer and his crops are just abundant. As a matter of fact, he cannot, his barns are full and he can't store all that. And so he says to himself, he's, I'm going to have to build bigger barns. <clears throat> and so he says to himself, take your ease, soul, and drink and be merry because, you know, you've got it made. And then, of course, <clears throat> Jesus telling the story says, but God says, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. In other words, you thought that your treasure was on earth. But we need to think about the treasure that will last throughout eternity. And what we do here on earth sends treasures on, and these are spiritual things, but these are the ways we live our lives in such a way that we honor God. And so I think that probably helps us understand a little bit about uh, works and uh, treasures and sending treasures on to heaven. And someone sent me a, a note asking about that. I hope this answers the question for you. We're looking at the uh, plan of salvation. You see it on the screen. The Bible tells us that we need to hear the gospel and believe it, repent and confess our faith in Jesus, receive baptism for forgiveness of sin with a commitment to living faithful to him the rest of our lives. If we'll do that, then the scripture teaches us that we'll one day hear on judgment day, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, now I'll make you ruler over many things. Those words are taken from Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. But it simply means that we'll be welcomed into heaven, the home of God, and we'll live there in eternal bliss forevermore. If you've already obeyed these commands, but you need the prayers of the church, tonight's the night to ask your brothers and sisters to pray with you and for you. Whatever your need may be, if you need to come to the Lord, once you come now, while together we stand and sing.